Hello, and welcome to the Physical Preparation Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Robertson, and I'll be joined on the line later today by David Sutton. Now, before we jump into this week's episode, I'm going to give you the shortest recap of what's going on in my world because the next couple episodes are going to be a little bit different with regards to the intro. Number one, I am going on vacation next week, which I am massively looking forward to. And number two, the podcast team that helps me produce the show, do all the notes, they take amazing care of me, they are taking a short vacation as well. So the next couple weeks, we're going to kind of batch all the podcasts together. So I won't give you the traditional like recap, but what you will get is a deep thought from yours truly that will hopefully inspire you, motivate you, and help you take your game to the next level. So before we jump into the show, a uh, little thought on our vacation. Like I said up top, super looking forward to this. Jess and I, the kids and I, we were all sitting down talking the other day. And I mean, it's been like four months since we have been out of the greater Indianapolis area. And I don't travel a ton anymore. I've had those years where I did travel a ton and flew around and spoke and consulted and did all that. I've kind of steered away from that. But, you know, I'm not going to fly here. I like I'm excited to just get out for a little bit. Don't worry. We're not going to Florida or any of those hot hot spots with regards to COVID. We're going to go up to Michigan. We've done this basically every year for I want to say like the last 10 or 11 years. I feel like we started it before we even had Kendall. And and since we've had kids, we've just kind of gone further south so we don't have to drive quite as far. You know, instead of going seven hours up to Traverse City, now we go like three and a half, four hours to like Holland or South Haven, Michigan. So beautiful little spots, great time of year. It's a little bit cooler up there. Just looking forward to getting out, going to the beach, relaxing for a couple days. And our whole thought process was, hey, look, we're going to do this. And then in like a week and a half, we go back to school. Well, the school board, like as of yesterday, basically decided that oh, originally we were going to go back to school August 5th. And now they're saying, well, at least until Labor Day, everything's going to be virtual learning. So at least for me, this was like kind of like a deadline, for lack of a better term. I was looking at that. It's okay. August 5th, kids go back to school. Is it going to be different? Yes. But will we have a routine? Will they be out of the house, you know, in their school routine, which would allow me to get back to my work routine, which would allow my wife to get back to her work routine? So we were really looking forward to that date. And now here the whole script is flipped at least another month where they'll be at home, which look, I'm not upset about, right? Like I love my kids, but I think we would all benefit from some structure, from some routines in our life. And that's a best case. I mean, they said at least until Labor Day. So my thought for today, and this is a discussion that I had with Kendall because, man, I love that girl so much. She loves school. She loves the social aspect and seeing her friends and her teacher. So teaching moment for her today. I just told her, look, like we can't control the school thing, right? Like we can't control whether school's open or not, or whether we have to do virtual learning from home or not. But what we can control is our response to that and how we feel about that. And so the the message that I tried to instill in her today was like, look, control the controllables. Like we can't control whether school opens, but we can control our response to that. And I said, when things get like this for me, I try and you know, cope with it, deal with it as best that I can. And then I try and refocus my energies on things that I do have control over. So she's super excited to pack and go on vacation. So I said, look, we can't control the fact that school is closed. And yes, we can be disappointed. We need to go through that. But once we've had that initial disappointment, like let's move on and let's refocus our energy on packing and getting excited for vacation. So I don't know how this would maybe apply directly to you because I don't know your situation, but I think the message is universally applicable, right? Take a look at your response to bad situations. And I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I respond perfectly to everything because I don't. And I have moments where I'm down or I'm sad or I'm depressed or frustrated like that. That is part of the human experience. But I think the quicker you can move off of those negative feelings, those negative emotions, or that lack of control and start to take ownership of your situation, take ownership of your response, the easier 
it's going to be for you and the happier you're going to be as a result. Okay, that does it for this little segment. We're going to have a quick message about the Complete Coach Certification. If you're not already on board with this, if you haven't checked out the insiders list, if you're interested in taking your game to the next level, you need to learn about it. So quick message about that, and then we'll jump into this show with Dave. It seems like every day I talk to a young trainer or coach who is frustrated. Maybe they're frustrated with the results they're getting. Maybe they're frustrated because they don't have trusted resources to learn from. And maybe they're frustrated because they simply don't have enough clients and wonder how long they'll be able to stay in the industry. So if that sounds anything like you, I've got something that I know will help. My Complete Coach Certification was created for trainers and coaches just like you, who are serious about the results they get and who know that becoming a better coach can directly translate to a bigger bottom line. This certification is gonna take the last 20 years of my life's work and put it all into one massive course. In it, you'll learn how to use the R7 system to create seamless, integrated, and efficient programs for clients and athletes of all shapes and sizes. How to create the culture, environment, and relationships with everyone you train so you can get the absolute best results. And the exact progressions, regressions, and coaching cues I use in the gym from squatting and deadlifting to pressing and pulling and everything in between. Of course, there's a ton more that I cover, but that should give you a pretty good idea of what the cert is all about. Now here's the thing, spots for the certification will only open twice per year for a limited time only. If you're interested in learning more, my next cert will launch in March of 2020, and if you join my free insiders list, you'll be able to save $200 when it opens. To get on the insiders list, just head over to completecoachcertification.com. Again, completecoachcertification.com, and then stay tuned for emails in the coming weeks. Thanks so much for your support, and I hope you'll pick up a copy of the Complete Coach Certification when it launches. Known as a positive disruptor, David Sutton has worked in more than 16 sports at the elite level and has a unique track record of maximizing the physical preparation of athletes worldwide. David has spent the last four years in Shanghai, China, in a variety of roles, and is currently performance lead for swimming. Prior to his time in China, he worked in professional cricket in the UK, helping North Ants CC transition from the least successful team in the UK to three finals and two national titles within four years. In this show, David and I talk about what it was like to move from the comforts of the UK to China, the issues he struggled with, both in regards to communication and the culture. And finally, we talk about the advice he would give to young coaches who are looking to take their game to the next level. This was a really eye-opening show, and I think you're going to love it. But enough for me. Let's do this. David, man, thanks so much for coming on the show here today. Really excited to chat with you. Could you start by just telling us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, well, I've just entered my 21st year of coaching, which has flown by, and I've kind of realized that I'm not going to be coaching anyone that's older than me now. <laughs> I've been working in strength and conditioning and sports science and performance support for, for all that period, and I've had a you know, really wide range of experiences. And now I've been in China for four years, which is which has flown by. It's just been a, you know, the kind of talk about the journey is the reward. You know, it's like yes. I've never planned anything, and I've I've come from a point where I was – you know, I was fortunate to be a founder member of the UKSEA in 2004, and you know, that's when I, you know, met John Noonan that you've had on, you know, yeah. recently, and it's, it's seen that evolution. And I've, I've kind of just tried to hold on to the coattails of, of people ever since, really. Yeah. I love it, man. I love it. So tell me, 21 years now, what originally got you into the world of physical preparation? How did you get started in all this? I mean, I've always been a sport fan. I remember I was talking to my dad recently, and I was saying, and he said, "Oh, do you know you used to win the so '84 Olympics, LA?" He said you you were no, five or six or something, and he said, "Yeah, you, know, you would talk about the sand jump." You know, obviously I'm in the long jump, but that <laughs> yeah. kind of was. And then I remember being at '88 Olympics, and I was in the UK, and it was like, well, I couldn't actually watch it, but I knew it was going on. So that's, that sport's been always an interest, and then. I was an okay athlete, a few different sports, and I tried my hand at a few different things. But it was, I remember I went on to study sports science when it was really early, like 96, 97, I studied, started my undergraduate in sports science. And, you know, the, the UK just had a terrible Olympics. You know, we, we were really bad at 90, Atlanta, 96. Yeah. And that was like, you sure you want to study sports science? Yeah, there's a career <laughs> for this or something. But actually, I, I, remember, I remember reading one of Bomper's books, and it was about, 
there was just a chapter about like ma- macro cycles and weekly plans and that manipulation of the effect of this on that and like how would you lay out you know an athlete's training and up until po- that point I'd never actually in any of the sports I'd done myself had a formal okay this is going to be the plan for the next month and this is why we're going to do the speed power here because of the impact later on and sure. this is you know the kind of and that was just like this is so cool you know when I graduated I was just I was keen to just start work straight away you know I, as many people I ended up in the gym but I pretty quickly found some athletes to work with as well and you know just expanded that and you know ever since then it's just been like a, a real passion of mine and I've been fortunate to follow that dream now for 20 years so that's awesome man so if you don't mind again like 20 years that's a, a pretty big chunk of both of our lives sounds like we've been in it for about the same amount of time would you just talk to us a little bit about your career path because especially you and I both are passionate about helping young coaches and mentoring young coaches and yeah. I think it's helpful for them to hear that you know you didn't just walk out day one and get commissioned to go work in China right like so talk no, about your career no, no, path no, no, no. a little bit if you don't mind so four years in China I was actually I was actually I came here first in 2008 before the Olympics for for some test events that was that was interesting and then 2012 I was headhunted to go to another province to Guangzhou but that didn't that fell through at the time so it's kind of China's been on my cards for a little while before I came to China, I was in professional cricket. I was fortunate to get a role uh, with North Ants. They were, at that point, a not very successful team. We went through a period where they were, we, we were very, really successful. We won, whilst I was there, we went to two finals in three years, winning one of them. And the year I left, I left you know, midway through the preseason period, and they went on to win another national title. So it was awesome. you know, three titles in four. And before that, their first title was 1992. And Cricket is fascinating. It's you know it's it's kind of like baseball in the fact that you're you're on the road a lot. You're playing night games and day games, and you know, cricket's got this nuance of four day games. You know, yes. it's, it's a and, and and we had a very small squad. It was the smallest squad, and we had the smallest budget. So it was about this is and I like problems like this. I don't like yeah. easy things. You know, yes. so it was okay. We got this. But okay, what can we do with what we've got? And it was just finding ways to solve what performance problem is. This is the situation that's not going to change. How can I then develop it? But previously, that briefly, I was the the first S and C at a like a sports college for 16 to 18 year olds, and we had some national talent ID programs based there, and some more general athletes. And I was coaching maybe six or seven hundred athletes a week. You know, oh it was gosh. just great. Like, I really wanted, to, <laughs> I really wanted to take that job as like just improve my coaching eye. Like I could have fifty guys in the gym and me you know and yeah. like, and previously to that I was you know I went self-employed as a personal trainer kind of coach really early on because I realized that if I was working for someone then and if an opportunity came up I couldn't just go yes and you know I, I remember going to a sports science seminar I remember Steve you know from what's he called I, th- I think it was podcast in a second <laughs> but like I remember going to my bank manager and saying look I can't afford to go to this seminar but it's going to be really important for my career. Can you lend me some money to, you know, that that was the kind of like a hundred pounds, I mean, hundred fifty dollars or something. You know, that was yeah. that was the you know the cost of it. And I remember, you know, going to golf tournaments because I'd met a psychologist that would introduce me to a few players, and she talked about, oh no, you've got to dress like a golfer here because otherwise no one's going to take you seriously. And right. Just all these little things, and and it's funny, I, I was really keen just to. Like watch people's warm ups. I contact physios. Look, a lot of time the physios were leading the warm ups. You know, in the early two thousands, I wasn't yeah. even a full time strength coach or fitness coach. I'm like, can I come and watch your warm up? <laughs> and then people are now like, people are now like, can I come and spend a couple of days or whatever? I was like, I just, I just want to watch the warm up because I think it's just you know that preparation. Of how do you get athletes from zero to what they need to do? Yeah, you know, still fascinates me to the, this day that like just that preparation period and seeing how they come in and you know how how do you prepare them for the the training ahead is it's really interesting so that's that's kind of my advice for young people as well it's just like yes you know, just just go in and just watch and yep. you know just just try just try and just try and get around things but i'd coach anything you know i went to nepal in 2007 to work with they're one of the like the top ranked mountain biker yeah and a charity paid me to go out and i didn't make a cent you know it was the charity paid me they were trying to help this guy Yep. But I got three weeks in Nepal and I worked with an elite mountain biker in the Himalayas. You know, That's pretty cool. You know, stuff like that. It's just, you know, just find these opportunities, be flexible enough to take them. And the other thing is, as long as you've got a cash cow, as long as you've got some income and you figure out that's my income and then everything else on top of it allows me to do what I need to do in order to pursue the goal. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I love it, man. 
if that makes sense. No, that makes perfect sense. So I want to start with a fairly simple question. So you're in the UK, you're working with Cricket, and then you get the China gig. And obviously that has evolved quite a bit over the years. So I'd love to hear about Mm -hmm. the evolution that you've gone through and maybe some of the major roadblocks that you struggled with when you got there. A lot of people are like, well, why are you leaving a team that's successful? You know, I, you know, I had a salary, I had a good job. You know, I, we just, we're just doing pretty well. And, and I had this, I kind of had this itch for a while that if an opportunity came up abroad, I would, I would just take it. I came out to Shanghai and they, they interviewed me. And the thing about the China system is you have, it's such a big country. You know, it's 1.4 billion people and people don't understand how big this is. And you know, Shanghai has got a city, a city of 25 million people. Yeah. And then we can pull other athletes in from other places as well. So, and so province against province is a, a huge part of the thing. And you, you've got some other problems. There's 80 million people, 100 million people. You know, it's just, it's just huge. So, yeah. And they got this huge lumbering government-funded athlete development, Chinese Institute of Sport. And, you know, the opportunity came up and it wasn't smooth and there were some delays in my contract and – you know, it was it was quite a difficult time, and then I moved out there, and a few things weren't ready, and it was just like, okay, you got to just bed in. I don't speak the language, you know, at that point, and it was, you know, it's like, wow, this is kind of challenging. But I went into a role where we have several campuses in the city, and this one has all the elite juniors, so you can join there anywhere between three and thirteen, eighteen years old. And just understand the feeding system into that. We test about, I don't know, 5,000 eight-year-olds every maybe three months, something like this, this <laughs> the talent identification program. And it's early specialization across the board. There is some transition now, but they're pretty good at picking who they need to do. Like, you know, I had 14-year-old volleyball girls who looked me in the eye. You know, there was, right. you know, I'm six two, six three, So it's like, <laughs> and this campus also had the judo and baseball and softball as a senior full-time professional teams. And the other thing is that China has a national games. Like it's like an Olympics for China once every four years, but it's the year after the Olympics normally. So it'll be, it will be next year anyway. And preparation for that is a lot of what coaches make their living from. It's like their, their peak. If you can get some athletes to the national team, great. But you've got such a massive pool of athletes feeding into the national team. And then the ones that actually go to the Olympics, that's just minute you know it's so tiny yes. yeah that actually a lot of a lot of really great work happens at this provincial level and that's that's the great opportunity so i went in as the lead strength and conditioning coach for the junior system i had six or seven coaches chinese to educate develop encourage you know support where i could and then i worked with the judo as well and i traveled with them a lot we went to three or four altitude camps and we went to because you, we don't have this competition system in China very much with a lot of sports where we're competing even on a monthly basis. Yep. You've got to go to a province. You've got to go and stay. Maybe three other provinces will go to the same place and you'll have a camp together. Okay. And you'll do six weeks together or something like this. And that, that way you're creating that, you know, that competition environment. Challenges, it was, you know, I was the only foreigner in the campus, you know. So there's been a few more since then and, you know, and that, that helped a little bit. I didn't speak the language. I made many cultural faux pas. You know, I, I insulted people. I didn't realize I was doing it at the time. I I struggled with understanding the culture and how things worked. And because I didn't have a grip of the language, then it was you know doubly hard. And then when you work, and this is the advice for anyone that works abroad, if you're working with a translator, you're going to have their interpretation of what someone else has said. And they may or may not want to pass on your message. Because if your message, especially in Asian countries where the face and respect and the cultural hierarchy is so much more complicated, then there's tiers of what you can say and how you can explain things or whatever. Hmm. But that, that's, that was the challenges. But ultimately, it was learning how can I fit in here? How can I make a difference? How can I learn from the mistakes? And then, you know, I had a, I had a lot of success. I had a, a lot of people that slowly started to open their minds to what was potentially possible you know china's got this great training system but maybe not scientifically so evolved and not maybe not so self-critical of the work that's taking place Hmm. but in 2000 i guess or 2018 we went i took some staff from various departments research departments and performance departments we went to germany for a youth conference strength and conference and then i took them to the uk and we went to see arsenal football club we went to see the British Olympic Association. We went to Bath University to see Sean Cummings about the maturation research. 
it's like it's been one thing it was like i was talking about it and then i took them to europe and we all saw what i was talking about and that's right. that's you know but i wouldn't have got to that point if i hadn't you know made progress in relationships and i'm still here and in china right. if you if you're not if you're not wanted anymore no one will tell you you're not wanted anymore you just won't have another contract <laughs> right you know, it's, it's, it would just be like oh no there's maybe there's some delays or maybe there's you know maybe there's a problem with the paperwork or something and then a month will go by and two months and i'm still here you know so yeah that's I, great. I, I guess i'm surviving that's great so one thing i'm interested in is you mentioned like cultural faux pas and this kind of actually blends kind of seamlessly into the next question I had, because again, you didn't only switch sports and switch kind of focuses with regards to your training and your coaching, but you switch countries and now you've got cultural issues, you've got communication issues. So I would love to hear maybe some of the cultural faux pas that you made early on. I'd love to hear about how you communicated <laughs> early on. And most importantly, like how's your Chinese these days, man? So the, I'm, I'm, and I've pushed a lot of these down deep, you know, into my soul, <laughs> trying to forget about this. So thanks for the therapy. Uh, I um, smoking in China is still considered a important male pastime. Let's say that. Mm. Uh, not many females smoke, but a lot of males do. And there was an older soccer coach, and he was just in the gym, just smoking. And I was like, it's like week one or week two. I was like, oh, dude, what are you doing? You're smoking in the gym, like, and he's he just <laughs> dropping ash on the floor. And you know, I, I kind of. You know, I, I made it pretty clear face to face that it wasn't a good thing. And that was just massively wrong. Like mm. it's, you know, I can't, you can't, it was the whole the quote, you like, you can't stop the ways but you can learn to surf and there was better ways to do it. And I think coming from a professional sport where sometimes it's confrontational, sometimes it's face to face, sometimes it's, you know, in front of a group, China's the opposite. It works in a very non-direct way because the culturally, the, the key thing is stability. And the group is more important than the individual and relationships are more important than your ability. Hmm. So I've learned and, I, and I've learned from that for sure. I got frustrated several times where I didn't pick up on the fact that a lot is not said, it's suggested. Hmm. Yeah. And if you can if you can understand the nuances of that. And that, 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 that that's cross cultural. You know, every country has their subtleties and nuances. Yeah. And the more I've more I've worked on that, and there's a there's a really good book called The Culture Map, which I'll, I'll send you the link for, which is yeah. just super interesting. Looking at these cultures, if you put this culture with this culture or this country with this country, this is where the clashes will happen, mm. and this is where the things that like they're common ground. And the other thing was when I came to China, people said, "Oh, foreigners can't learn Chinese; it's too hard." Yeah, for sure, it's like top three or four lang hardest languages in the world. It's tonal; the characters are. Yeah, three thousand or four thousand or something that you oh need to get to before your your thing. And then you know, I, I tried a little bit, and I was you know relying on some translation, but I didn't have a full time translator. And then a couple of things happened. One, a couple of people around me they developed their Chinese, and they, that was that was quite inspirational to see. But the other thing was I started watching videos online and seeing reading a few blogs about polyglots. You know, the people who can speak five or eight or ten or. 20 languages and they're right. you know they're proficient they're proficient at these languages and they're like i'm like yeah okay they can speak 15 languages and maybe they're fluent in five why can't i learn chinese and again it's that high performance problem it's like okay we've got a small budget and a small small squad but what can we do right. okay these guys can speak 15 languages reframe the problem can i do it i'm at the point now and it's probably been a year deep where if i talk people automatically reply to me in chinese even if they got some english there I coach in Chinese. I don't coach in English unless one of the athletes wants to practice their English. And in that case, you know, it gives my brain a rest. Right. I have a teacher, but it's you know, I don't. I'm not face to face because I'm traveling with teams or I'm at training camps or at the training base. So I um, yeah, you know, I, I maybe I get an hour or two a week if I get, if I'm lucky to study with a teacher. But other than that, it's self study. But it's you know, I look back at my French of six or seven or eight years at school and, you know, my, my Chinese is way past that. And people say, oh, you're in China. You know, it's it's not osmosis. You know, you can't pick up one of the hardest languages in the world. Right. You know, without – and there's a lot – in Shanghai, you can get away with not speaking as much Chinese because it's a bit more multicultural and good levels of English in places and, and this kind of thing. But it's it's opened up opened up so much to me that I can communicate with a coach – and get 80% of the meaning without any problem at all. And yeah, often we great. have a good conversation and I can talk to the athletes. And today we had a meeting, but I put a photo on my Instagram. Actually, we had a meeting with all the swimming provinces in China, all the coaches, all on one big screen, like it was zoom 2.0. <laughs> right. 
And it's like, well, I'm not going to understand all of it, but this is my listening practice for the next two hours. And so I sat through this two hour Chinese meeting and I probably got 60 percent of it. And it's it's just finding different ways to learn that you weren't taught formally. And it's enjoyable. It's, it's, it's enjoyable now. And I didn't think I would be that person that enjoys language. Now, I'm, now I'm, you know, I'm thinking, what's the next language? But, yeah. but I'm going to keep going. But it's nice now I think and dream in Chinese and, you know, people are either surprised or impressed or sometimes they can't believe it, you know. So it's a, it's a, it's a yeah. fun it's a fun thing, you know. That's awesome. But it's, it's like, and like in other sports, like when I was in cricket, when they're warming up the batters, they've got, the, you know, like the dog sticks and they throw the ball with the dog sticks to try yeah. and get that whip on it and that spin and acceleration. And I learned to do that. And it took me a year or so and a lot of time, it took a while for them to trust me that I wasn't going to hit them in the head, you know. It's, <laughs> but actually, that was a tool. That was a tool that allowed me then to work one-on-one, whether it was in rehab or someone that, you know, wanted some extra practice or whatever or needed some extra conditioning. Like, well, I can throw balls at you at the same time and we can make it like a batting conditioning drill or whatever. It's the same thing with this. You've got to find that little hook that's going to differentiate yourself within the organization because you're you're not just another foreign coach you're not just another coach that's coming into this team or this system yep. you've got to find a way to differentiate yourself and this is now my hook that i can just switch into that language and go right yeah i love it man so you you talked a little bit about this before but you know i've heard a lot about other other countries and their training systems obviously russia bulgaria those are things we are all i feel like exposed to when you're our age, like that was things that, that we read about and we learned sure. about. But I feel like the Chinese system is much more shrouded in mystery. So if you're able to share, I would love to know just like how is the system working and how is it maybe different from what you've seen in the States, in Europe? I mean, any kind of comparisons would be huge. Uh, so the the first thing is that China-wide, the junior system is this. The junior system was that they were in, if they're at that senior level of this elite high school kind of thing, they're 14 years old. They go to school in the morning on campus, they eat lunch, they go to bed, and then they get up at like maybe one thirty-two after a nap and they train 2 to 5.30. Okay. So, and then they'll train Saturday morning. So that's there. They're getting, 14-year-olds getting 25 hours a week, no problems at all, regardless wow. of the sport. Okay. And time is controlled. In the senior system, maybe there's some early mornings. We do generally less of that, but... Uh, typical is 9 to 11, 11, 15, eat, sleep, and then 3 till 5, 5.30 is the kind of rough structure that right. fits most of, most of the time. I remember I, was, I went to a training camp with a judo in another city, in the province, Chongming, uh, Chongqing. They do till 11.45. Okay. So suddenly we were in half an hour longer in the morning. Like all my guys were exhausted. They're like 11.15, mm-hmm. they're tapping out. And we went to their <laughs> place. Right, so we were like, we've got like another three hours of training in a week without even trying that. The emphasis, for sure, like the high skill sports, you know, ping pong, diving, gymnastics, early specialization. I've learned a lot about skill acquisition and I see how well they practice skills and how diligent they are and just how efficient they are in, in these delivery of skills. You, know, you, you see, and when other coaches come to China and I show them around, they're like, Wow, that 13 year old's got a better technique than my 18, 19, 20 year olds, you know, and that's the drill. This high volume of training also, I think, is very protective injury wise because we just don't get muscle injuries. Mm -hmm. I don't see hamstring tears. I don't see calf tears. They just don't exist. And we can debate acute chronic, but we know that good, consistent work is protective. Yep. The challenge sometimes is that they miss out on high and low intensity. So yep. really high intensity, that real high intensity work sometimes doesn't happen. There's just more medium volume yep. and that low intensity stuff. Well, that's too easy. Like why we're doing that. And then the other thing is it's very stable for the coaches because of the cultural system. So if you're a coach, you probably can't lose your job. Yeah. That's now there's nice. pressure from your bosses and so on. Yeah. Now, that gives you freedom. And like I said, the time's not a problem here. If I want to train a team than my swimmers now if i want to lift in the gym for two and a half hours i've got two and a half hours there's no problem with that hmm. and when i when i came here and i saw the judo and like i was watching them training i was like christ if i come in with four sets of four here they're going to under train in three weeks you know i'm going to actually undercook them i've got right. to find ways to get volume into their work while still fitting into where i thought actually the games were meant to be strength or power or, or whatever okay. 
And you've got to be super clever with how you can find ways to fill the time. You know, I had a special project last year with a modern pentathlon, and they got a whole lot of work anyway. But I had the for the like the mini band filler exercise for like you know glutes or whatever. Basically, what I was doing was buying them time, and I made them take their shoes off every single set. <laughs> so they do the lifting work and then they take the shoes off and then they put the band on and then they do whatever they just this small right. filler exercise and they, but i was buying them four minutes of rest before the next strength exercise and the, and the coach was like why are they taking the shoes off i was like, oh it's for proprius i almost spoke chinese there benti band benti ganju so <laughs> proprioception yeah so like, sometimes i'm switching in the, in the wrong language now yeah. so like it was like oh proprioception is like great you know it's awesome but you've got to find these tricks of how to look after them and get a lot of work done so it's interesting. It's interesting. The generation of coaches and athletes coming through now are more open. They're the first generation. And so they are asking more questions. Yep. But culturally, you don't question authority. Yes. So it's, you know, it, and if I, if I do a lecture in China to a, a, a university students, I'll get some questions. If I do it to coaches, I will get zero. I will get zero questions. It's not like, you know, when you present in the UK or Europe or US, Right. And like, like there's 20 questions and then there's three or four personal questions afterwards. Yes. And then some guys following you to the car. Yeah. And then, you know, someone tries <laughs> to find out, find out which hotel you're in. Absolutely. In. You know, that's, 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 that, that's that great passion for questions and stuff, but that doesn't necessarily happen here. So you've got to find ways to develop the relationship with the coaches to the point where they open up a little bit. And then you find that little window of, ah, oh, can I just understand a bit more of what that was? That's you know? fascinating. So like, even if you said at the start, if you have questions, ask them, most of the time they wouldn't ask questions. That's nah. I mean, if you said, if you said, look, no one's leaving until you ask two questions, I, I, I've thought about saying that. <laughs> but, right. Uh, <laughs> but I don't think that would work either. It's, uh, and that, that's fine. It's just, it's, you've got to understand the culture. And people, we talk about the culture of a sport, you know, cricket culture is very different to, you know, rugby. Yeah, sure. Or, you know, or triathlon and or golf, you know, how you dress. So you've got to understand the nuances of these sporting cultures. And the more you can understand about that and not just go in and go, and I made these mistakes going in, oh, but this is this is crap because actually we should be doing da, 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 da. Oh, come on. They've kind of been successful without you. you know? Right. Right. That's but that's the way I think, unfortunately, a lot of us are, especially early on. It's like, oh, well, they sucked and then I came in and now they're better. So it must be me. Versus, no, they just have better players or a better coach or whatever. So, okay. So, arguably, the hottest topic that's going on, like, across the globe these days is the COVID pandemic. And, obviously, it's something that, being in China, you've dealt with firsthand. So, I'd love to know how you and your staff have dealt with the situation and what impact it's had on your training. The first advantage that we probably had, so I, just a quick bit of context, that I was... I signed my new contract and I had to go through a new visa process. So January, most of January, I wasn't in China. Mm. And then the end of China, end of January was Chinese New Year and I was away. And that's when everything started yeah. to happen. Yeah. So what happened was that I think maybe the end, right at the end of January, they locked down all the training bases. And they can do that because everyone's central six, six and a half days a week. And... So they just locked it down, and therefore food can come in. The athletes can all live here. Coaches could all live here. And I was still on the outside of this point, but this is the situation. And so that was the first thing. They just locked it. And that's, that's not a bad thing. You know, that's your asset. Your asset is your athletes. And if you can protect them in a bubble, then you know, that's great. And that's kind of what's happening around the world now. Right. So then the second, the second thing was that – and those, by the way, those athletes didn't get out of lockdown as far as being in the training base till May the 4th. Or maybe the third, something like that. Oh, wow. So they did three months. Yeah. But they, they were still training. They were still training. They just yeah. went a little bit crazy. But right. I still had to fly back to the UK. I flew back into China maybe February 1st or 2nd. And then I still had to go to the UK for a couple of days just to pick up some paperwork for my new visa. And it was like, it was just like the world was just getting a little bit interesting. Like there was a few cases in Thailand and a few cases in Vietnam and it was just spreading a little bit. I was like, I've got to go now. And I made the decision to pay for my own flight. I wouldn't wait for the government to pay for my flight, the Chinese government to pay for my flight. I was like, I'm going, I've just got to go. But I took all the precautions, you know, at that point we were already in mask wearing, we were already in temperature checking, everything yep. was starting to lock down. I flew out and I arrived in Dubai first before flying into UK and it was like nothing had happened. And this is May the 5th. Oh, sorry, for, sorry, February the 5th. Yeah. And literally nothing was happening. And I, I, went, I flew on to London 
I stayed in my room pretty much in London, I, apart from getting some food. I went to the visa office. That was a ghost town. I collected all the documents that I need. And then three days later, I flew back. I was back in Shanghai on February the 9th, I think, something like that. Arriving to Shanghai, one of the most populous cities in the world, population of 25 million people, you know, 19 subway lines, and it was literally like a ghost town. Arrived at the airport, I was registered, I was, you know, all the paperwork, I went straight to my apartment, I stayed there for the next two and a half weeks. By that point, we already had the phone checking system, the tracking system in place. Before I could go back to work, I had to go to a hospital to get medical checks. But in order to do that, I had to show that I hadn't moved. And that's why the tracking app works mm. really well. But then the other thing is, and this is really interesting, culture point of view. I Nobody wanted this. And, you know, it's such a big country. You know, the, actually, Shanghai handled it really well for the size. We we had very few deaths and very few cases considering the size of it. And it's because, for example, say you were a sports scientist employed by the government or say you worked in I don't know, highway management, something like this, right? Yeah. Your job was during this end of January through February, maybe into March, was to help making sure that every area of the city had tracking procedures in place. There was one route in and out of like roads and apartments, you know, and the other way of these compounds have got several apartment blocks in them. Yeah. And there's one route in and out and you're only allowed to leave once a day. And I, I was speaking to Joe Club, at the, I don't know if you know Joe Club, she's out of the, of the Buffalo Bills and you, mm. should, you should definitely talk to her. I was talking to her about this, and I kind of drew an analogy that it was, you know, like in a good team, a good professional organization, a good elite athletic team, whatever it has to be, if everyone kind of pulls together, like after practice, everyone picks up the balls and the cones or whatever, you know, it, everyone gets to lunch earlier. Yeah. And, you know, and, and loading the bus and, you know, your physio's job is not to spot someone in the gym. Well, the sports scientist's job is not necessarily to, you know, help the coach mark out a training area or, you know, all these kind of multidisciplinary roles. Yep. But actually, it was the same thing here. Everyone went, right, this is the situation. It's not a good situation. We need to protect what we have here, which is an incredible life in a great city. How can we do it? Well, actually, I'm going to be the one standing on the street corner registering residents going in and out every day. Because that's the bigger picture, and that's where this stable global organization, global cultural organization is more important than the individual. And that's what Chinese culture is compared to Western culture, is that individual versus the group. Sure. And, you know, I think the way, if you pull together, if everyone pulls together and goes, this is what it is, then so on. And it was mask wearing up until, I mean, downtown now, there's still some mask wearing. It's probably 40% now. But even when things started opening up, maybe March, April, and I went back to work and this kind of thing, it was two temperature checks a day. It was temperature checks on arrival at work. If you wanted to go in a cafe or restaurant that was allowed to open at that point, it was register your name when you walked into the, into the cafe. Oh, wow. Everyone was registering their names. But then it was like, okay, so we've got, we know everyone that's come into this cafe. All you have to do is write down your name, write down your cell number, plus they had the tracking app. That's fine, you know, because I'd rather the coffee shop was open than not. Right, right, right. Yeah. You know, and that's a bigger picture that everyone knows. And if one person got sick in here, then we know pretty much 98% of the people that were in that cafe on that day or so yes. on. And it's, it's meant that we've gone back to work and training the life and, yeah, still confined space like the subway, which is a like I said, the, the subway is huge here. It's just so big. Sure. But yeah, mask wearing is 100%. And people say, oh, you're not social distancing. Yeah, but we got the masking and the hygiene down from day one. Right. With our athletes here now, they're allowed to go back Saturday afternoon, Sunday, back into their homes if they're from Shanghai, see their families. They come back in, they have a temperature check. Apart from that, it's 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 not you know it's it's pretty normal. You know, yeah. we 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 were wearing masks in the dining room up at like in the the athletes' canteen up until maybe last week. Yeah. So that's, it's been a four month process, five month process. That's fascinating. But that, that that's what it is, and you know, and what can I say? I hope people re realize that difficult situations are going to happen in life, and it's about how you respond to it. Yep. Not about blaming or you know thing, and then whether that's sport or life or you know globally you know yeah. it's about how can we figure out a better solution you know to what we what the problem is you know absolutely absolutely so i want to just kind of divert here for a second because i know mm -hmm. one thing that you and i both love talking about is advising and mentoring young coaches yeah, so I love it. I love it. if you could give like the young coach or trainer that's listening to this episode one piece of advice what would it be 
I think it's going to be two part. The first part is I get LinkedIn invitations all the time, okay? And I, I often I try and reply to them, and I reply to all of them going, hi, thanks for the ad, thanks for the invitation to LinkedIn. How can I help you? And about 10% reply to me. Wow, that's crazy. So I'm confused. So I'm confused. Why did you add me? Like, <laughs> right. I, I, just, right. You know, on, you know on LinkedIn, LinkedIn is probably the least direct. So that's the first thing of just – just come with something, whether you're going to offer something or whether you're going to, you know, ask for advice, that's fine. But let's be prepared and, you know, just be organized and, you know, re- respect that person. Reply. And if they reply to you, definitely reply back to them. And, and, the, and the second thing is just just enjoy watching the sport. Just enjoy watching training. What Enjoy watching training more than the actual sport. Because if you see good athletes watch in training it's it's a thousand times better than the game sometimes yeah because they just they just they're just experimenting they're doing stuff and they're training and that training environment is just it's just so cool and I, I enjoy that sometimes more than the competition you know it's nice to see my athletes compete but it's that that training environment and even if they're doing the skill stuff you know you just like that's just super cool just enjoy that environment yeah that okay that's great advice because Something that I love watching is, and I don't get to do it all the time, but like with my basketball guys or my soccer players, I love going and just watching them practice and seeing the things that they do. And granted, it's awesome to watch them in a game, but sometimes you don't really, you can't really understand just how good they are just from the game. Like when you watch them in practice, and, and I've been guilty of this, especially like basketball, you watch them, you know, they hit 10, 15 shots in a row and you're like, oh, I could go do that. And then you go out there and you actually try yeah. it and you realize, no, I really can't. Like that, they are just very, very they that. And they make it look effortless, right? And consistent, right? Yes. It's just consistency, the consistency of, of efficiency. Yes, yes. So that's great advice. And yeah, if you're a young coach and you work with athletes, don't just go to the games. Whenever you can, watch a practice, watch everything about you know, how they move, how people run sessions. I think there's a ton to be learned from that as well. Watching other coaches coach, especially not from your yeah. your world. So that's great advice, man. All right, dude, big question. Uh, time. I think the other thing is oh, really, ahead, really, really, qu- really quick. I just, yeah, yeah, really quickly. One other point was I remember talking to my interns in the past. And when we go to a conference together, I was like, if I see you talking to each other, there's 300 people here. And if I see you talking to each other, you're out of a job on Monday <laughs> because I want you to go, go and go and speak to 15 people you've never met before. Because yes. there's people like like John and you just had Nick Grantham on recently and all yeah. these other people that I've met 15 or 20 years ago. And they've they've all helped me, you know, to some extent. And John, you know, John, I talk to every couple of days, you know, it's right. having those relationships with someone that you never knew and now actually they're a significant part of your life. You know, that's, that's the value of uh, meeting these people, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, my guy. So now, big question time. If you could alter the space-time continuum and give young David Sutton one piece of advice about training and or life, what would it be? I think talk with freedom. Don't be afraid to express how, you, how you're thinking and feeling rather than just trying to talk how people expect you to talk or how you think they want to talk. Just talk how you are. And then the other thing really quickly would be to accept that you're never going to get 100%. You're never going to change 100% of people. You're never mm-hmm. going to get a 100% result. It's accepting that if your day is going to be 7 out of 10 or 6 out of 10, make sure it's a 6 out of 6. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good one. Because how many times, especially if you are a high achiever yourself or high motivation, how many times do you walk home frustrated because of that one or two people that you just can't connect with? Or they're just not motivated intrinsically, right? Like they don't want to be there. They're just there because maybe they are high skill or something of that nature. Yeah. That's great. Great stuff, man. Absolutely. Okay. So last but not least, we've got our lightning round. Four fairly short questions, but your answers can be as long or as short as you'd like. All right. Number okay. one, what's your career highlight so far as a coach? Can you whittle it down to one? I mean, 21 years might be hard to come down to one, but you could give me a couple if that would be easy. I, I, I get yeah, a couple, yeah. Uh, I think the, the success in the cricket was one just because no one expected us to do it. Yes. And you know, we, we, we were really we weren't even ranked like it was and that and we we know why we did we knew how we did it and we knew why we did it and we know what that path was and i think knowing how you were successful is sometimes more important that was the, when yeah my family was in the crowd and sixty thousand people or whatever and it was just it's just super cool yeah the other thing is actually probably more important is when when the athletes trust you to the point where you just see that 
click in their training and they start to just kick that neck that next level yeah and it's just like and they understand they maybe don't remember what happened up until now but they now realize that something's working yeah and when they realize that you've got that oh you've made a little difference here i can feel or i can see the difference that's that's the, those are my two for sure yeah no i love that one okay oh, there's, num- so, there's so there's so many things yeah yeah, yeah that that's hard the, i think the longer you do it and I, I don't know i almost think of it as more as like there's highlights with each person right depending on how much yeah. time you get with somebody like you almost have like a little highlight from each of their careers so that's fun number two yeah, totally. as a performance lead what are some tips and tricks you have to get people across departments to communicate better I think because like with my new role in, in this performance lead in swimming, I haven't really talked about this much today, but you know, I've got a, my main role is strength and conditioning, but I've also got to be looking at biomechanics and video analysis and the coaching setup, which is super complicated and, you know, all these other nutrition. I think it's about not sitting around the table together as so much as you just got to go out and spend time with people, especially when they're not expecting you to arrive. <laughs> I guess it's, I'm just like a, you know, don't ask for permission, you know, ask for forgiveness. Like I'm a six right. year old, you know, but I'm, I'm just going to hang out in people's offices or I'll just go and see what they're doing. And slowly you can understand all of how these departments are working. But if you put them all together, then you're relying on their previously established cultural and relationship norms which if you go and see all of these separate entities individually and spend time that takes time it takes time and you should be in your office planning a program or whatever as well yeah but if you just get around these departments and see how they actually tick the individuals then you can start to then go step back and go oh actually i can see the bigger picture here because i understand that department and that person and you get these little snippets of information and then you can start weaving this web. And in China, you need to do this to an, another level for sure because the relationships are so complicated. But it's a skill that I think will help me in the future. Yeah, no, that's interesting. And I was actually going to ask like a follow-up to that because would you assume that it's more difficult in China just based on some of the cultural stuff and maybe not wanting to question or challenge other people as much? Yes and no. Yes, because you're not going to get a quick answer. You can't get a quick answer. You can't just walk into someone's office and slam the door. You can't walk in someone's <laughs> office and go, oh, okay, this, you know, it just doesn't work like that. You've got to right. be more sort of, if there's a problem, you've got to be really roundabout to try and hint about the problems. Gotcha. But I would say also, also the value on relationships is put ahead of ability and skill. So if you can't get on with people, if you can't figure out a way to develop the, and it's not develop individual relationships, it's develop the group relationship. Yes. If you're too unstable, if you're too disruptive, it's not going to, it's just not going to fly. So I think it's about just trying to ask, ask questions because most people won't ask questions of you, but it's more about just getting to know them and then maybe they'll volunteer a little bit of information. I gotcha. And then you could jump, you can, you can jump on that. Interesting. Okay, number three. What's the one thing you miss the most about being away from home? Uh, I, I can't say family. Do you know what? it's terrible? But I can't, you know, my, my family's <laughs> spread around the world, so we, yeah. we're all kind of relying on online. Probably English cho- British chocolate. You know, uh, that, okay. you don't you don't get that here. And I, I, when I do get to go home, which isn't very often, you know, some of, some of the foods a little bit. What else do I miss? I, I think I've I think I've been on the road, you know, so much in my life that I've kind of learned how to make the best of the, the, you know, your home is where your hat is, right? There's yes. that. Yes. Make the best of the situation. This is where I'm living. You know, right now, you know, I can't see myself going home this year. I don't think I'll leave Shanghai before October. Right. I think that's realistic. So it's right. it's about, I don't, I don't tend to miss too much because I'm focused on making the most of what I've got here and which is a good life and a cool city to live in, you know? Yeah. I love that viewpoint, man. That's awesome. Okay. Last but not least, number four, what's next for David Sutton? What are you working on? What are you excited about? Anything? I mean, so social media is kind of a, taking a bit of a back burner, partly because of learning culture, Chinese and so on, but also because the Chinese internet is, you know, I've got to be careful what I say here, but it's restricted. But I'm trying to, I'm trying to become, I'm trying to show a bit more on my Instagram and Twitter, like kind of just a bit more of what it's like here, just to, mm. just to kind of open up because it's pretty it's cool and I enjoy it. And it's a, it's a, it's a good, a good place to be. I'm studying at ACU, Australian Catholic University, the masters in high performance sport. You know, I've, I've mm. I waited 20 years to do a masters or 18 years to do a masters yep. because, you know, I've just enjoyed coaching, developing myself in a different way so long. 
and now I'm I'm ready to to to, to do that. So I'm doing that part time. It's just kind of fun. What else am I doing? I'm not talking very much. I'd like, you know, I, I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you. It's, it's yeah. kind of, I've got a lot of stuff. It's kind of stored up the last four years and some lessons. And I'm, you know, I'm keen to just maybe talk to people a bit more and maybe do a few more online conferences if that if that works for people. But other than that, it's just trying to, you know, keep challenging myself as far as the language and the culture because I've got a lot still to learn. And if I can get to that next level, then that's going to, you know, make a make a big difference to everything, really. You know, because yeah. it gets addictive when you get good at something. Or not yes. good, I'm not good yet. I'm not good. <laughs> but when you get better at something yes. and you see that there's a light at the end of the tunnel, then it's just that. It just keeps you, keeps you, you know, ticking over. And I think hopefully it's good for my brain as well, you know. Absolutely. Okay, so I lied. I do have one more question. <laughs> so oh, go, 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 go. Now, I'm just thinking, like, I know if I have a, a big coaching day, right? Like, I'm tired just yeah. mentally at yeah, the yeah. end. Like, it's weird because, you know, you're, like, tired physically, but then, like, mentally, especially if it's a good day, you're switched on, you're buzzing. How does it feel mm-hmm. now, considering you're doing so much coaching in Chinese? Is it more yeah. fatiguing than you would say in the past? Just because you're not only switched on coaching, but you're switched on from the language side of it as well. Yes, it is harder, but it's... I don't think I'm more tired because of working in Chinese because what a lot of people make mistake if this is a language trip tip but people make the mistake of thinking in their mother tongue or their main language yeah. and then translating or converting and that's absolutely wrong that's one of the mm. biggest lessons I learned you've got to be thinking in the other language okay so it actually comes so it comes so naturally it's the same way that if you're working on a new sport and after a while you pick up the nuances then you're, you're or you're driving to a new job and you after two weeks you don't think oh I arrived you know <laughs> I didn't realize I was driving. For right. day. It's that it's that like that automatic thinking process. I'm more tired because I probably get sometimes overthinking some of the problems, and sometimes gotcha. they're, some of they're super complex, some of they're simple. But I'm not sure. Yeah. Because it's still not my culture. It's still not. I'm a, I'm a still a guest here. Yes. And sometimes I've got to think about things because it's implied, and other times it's just as simple as it looks. So I yes. kind of overthink things a little bit. But I'm probably getting again just better at processing those and just just you know I've really got into bullet journaling the last year or so, and it's partly because writing out the bullet journal takes some time and it's a as, um, I'm not a good drawer I'm not a good you know it's not artistically beautiful but the other thing is I always make small mistakes with drawing the lines or lay, doing my layout for this week of my weekly plan or monthly plan because I'm doing this myself but it slows me down enough yep. that I'm starting is that thinking fast and slow it slows me down enough that I'm not thinking at a thousand miles an hour anymore yep. I'm not you know I'm not thinking too much on the line I'm just thinking about this and when I make a mistake in the book it's like you just made a mistake but it doesn't actually mean anything so just right. let that mistake go and keep writing so just finding that way to and I think that's probably the same with the language learning that it slows me right down. Even yeah. reading right now, you know, this the uh, I'm not reading at a good at the level I want to be reading at. And I literally I'm I don't know what that word is. I don't know what that character is. Okay, I've got to go through, I've got to look it up. Okay, now I understand. And, I, and it, it might take me you know, twenty minutes to write read three or four pages. Right. But a slowing down process that then allows your brain to make better cognitive thoughts i think yeah you know it's that it's like in the shower you have good ideas because you're, you're not focusing so much on what you're trying to solve yes okay what was that called bullet journal oh yeah bullet journals yeah i'll send a link on that that's that's just the uh, bullet journals have, have really you know been great for me and the other one was the the culture map and i'll send you yeah. those links for sure perfect and we'll make sure we get those in the show notes as well but David, man, I know it's getting late over there. Really appreciate your time today. Thank you so much for coming on. Could you just let my listeners know where they can find out more about you and all the great work you're doing? So I'll try and stick to my promise now because you, you've got an incredible following and you know, your podcast is you know, it's, it's really diverse and interesting. So I'll Thank I'll you. try and commit to it. My, my, Twitter, my Twitter and Instagram, both or Twitter's David C. Sutton and Instagram's same but maybe there's a like an underscore in there somewhere okay but put the links up for that and I'll, I'll try and just you know that's a good way for people to reach out for me and if the internet's been blocked or things have been restricted at some level then you know just give me a little bit of time you know and if you hit me up on hit me up on linkedin that's fine as well you can just you can just search for me i'll, I'll probably come up just make sure you reply perfect perfect yeah that's right you don't want to be one of the the 90 percent that does not reply that would not be cool so yeah David, again, man, thank you so much for your time today. It was really great talking to you. Oh, yeah, that's great. Thanks, thanks a lot, Mike.
All right, my friend, that does it for this week's show with David. Sincerely hope you enjoyed it. He was a really intriguing guy to talk to because I don't know of that many people that have gone on contract for extended periods of time into a foreign country where they don't speak the language, where they're not familiar with the culture. And in just four short years, he's had a massive amount of success. So very fun guy to talk to. I hope you learned a thing or two, and I hope you were intrigued and as interested as I was. If you were, and if you're enjoying the show, please do me one of two things. Number one, if you're not already subscribed, take two seconds out of your day, go to your favorite podcasting platform, and subscribe to the Physical Prep Podcast. iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Spotify, Google Play. If you consume podcasts there, chances are the show is there. So get subscribed. If you're already subscribed, thank you. Do me one more favor. Go on to the iTunes store Give me a rating and a review. The ratings and the reviews really help get the show exposed to more people. They bump up our overall rankings. And look, at the end of the day, I want to positively impact as many trainers, coaches, physical therapists as I possibly can. So if you would take two minutes out of your day and do that for me, I would greatly appreciate it. So my friend, that does it for this week's episode. Thank you so much for listening. I love and appreciate you. And we'll be back soon with our next episode. Take care.